that it may be well with thee and thou may live long on the earth. I'm just going to speak from the thought obedience to your parents, honoring your mother and father. Here's the thing. This is the one promise that you get from God. The one commandment that it may be well with thee and thou may live long on the earth. I won't give you any bad news. But I'm just going to tell you the truth. In Proverbs it says the children that don't obey their parents, they die. The children who are obedient to their parents may have long lives on the earth. Reason why? Your parents have what we call in the military time and service, meaning they've been around a while. They have experiences. They live this thing called life a little longer than y'all. Some kids think because they live a few years that they know more than their parents. Shut my mouth. I'm trying to figure out how they figure if you've only been around five, ten, three, two, one years that you know more than mom and dad who've been around forever. They've been around since dirt was dirt and it was sand and it turned into a rock. But it's the idea that parents know a little more than us. Even my mom knows more than me. But the thing is this, if you listen to them, it says right here, obey your parents. It's the right thing to do. Amen. Honor your father and mother. It's a commandment with a promise. And here's the promise for y'all. This is a gift that keeps on giving because you teach it to your children and your children teach it to their children and so on and so forth that you may live a long life. You can't be living for God and living a long life. Because the more you keep living, the more God keeps blessing you. Amen? Amen. Y'all return back to your seats. And that's the same for us. If we keep living for Christ, He keeps letting us stay around a little longer and a little longer and just a little longer. Amen? Happy Father's Day once again to everyone present in the sound of my voice. We are number one dads, and my favorite one is greatest dad in the galaxy. I just have this, I, as Sasha, I just have this thought that someday I might end up on the moon. If not the moon, on Mars. That's okay. I'm going to let that be your job to let me get there somehow, some way. That's your generation's job, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, my saints in Christ seated here before me, it's an honor and privilege to stand here. I'm not going to read the scripture first. I'm going to read it throughout the whole thing because this is a presentation just set forth for Father's Day. It's just for Father's Day, so I'm going to read the scripture as we go. So I'm going to pray and then begin. Father God, we thank you for each and every man present in the sound of my voice. Lord, we pray for every father in this nation, that if every father would lead their family to church, and if every man would be an example to other men, that if every young man would see the example set before them, that they would want to grow up and aspire to be a godly man. So I'm praying for every godly man. I'm praying for every ungodly man to become a godly man. Father God, I pray for every woman on the sound of my voice to pray for their sons, to pray for their husbands, to pray for their brothers, to pray. There is power in prayer. And when you pray over those you love, God hears and invokes blessings upon those. Those. He protects those. He covers those that you are praying for. So, Father God, if every man, if every male, if every person that you have designated sexually as a man stands up and be the man, as you say you were, walk worthy of your calling. If these men would just do those things, Lord, to bend their knee and bow their heads and obey you, Father God, they will see blessings. They will see honor. They will see things that will amaze them. And Lord, will show favor on them. So right now, Father God, I pray for each and every man in the sound of my voice and for their families and for their wives and their children that you cover them, that you bless them, that they may see you, Lord, and not me, that you humble me, Lord, and raise up in me and be seen by my congregation. Father God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for advance it for the one, the two, the whosoever wants to give their life to Christ this day. We thank you in advance for these blessings. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And the church said, Amen. 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 I would like to speak from the thought today. Show and tell. Show and tell. And if you have the packet, that's starting on chat on page 20 and 21. I'm going to give you five, five, five points for, for today. But turn at your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh my neighbor, I've got something to show you. The 
big question for everyone today is this. Do you know Jesus for forgiveness of your sins and salvation of your souls? How you prioritize your life may show your relationship with Jesus. And it may very well tell where you might be spending eternity. Can your family vote you as the most valuable papa? That picture there is um, Kevin, not Kevin, but, um, oh my gosh, singing. No, that's not LeBron James, but uh, I forgot. He was playing last night. I totally forgot. Singing. Durant. Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant had just won in, in 2017 the most valuable player when he was with the Golden, Golden State Warriors. But he won the most valuable player. But I changed valuable player to valuable papa. Because can you be the most valuable papa for your family? Can your children, can your wife, can the people who live under your roof call you the most valuable papa? Now there's two definitions of a man. There's the dictionary's definition, and I'll give you the dictionary. The dictionary defines a man as an adult male person physically different from a boy or a woman. That's simple enough. But Tony Evans, I like his definition if you would. Tony Evans says, a man, he says, a kingdom man is a male who places himself under the rule of God and lives his life in submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, that's a man that lives for Jesus, that lives for God. Not the definition, but what a godly man does. Thank you. Now, that's what we're going to see here today in today's text in 1 Kings it's second chapter of the first and fourth verse. David is challenging his son, King Solomon, to prove or show himself a man. What type of man? A man that is obedient to God's holy word. This is where I like to give you five so that you can thrive. Richard, that's for you, for the glory of God. Five for you can thrive. My first point this morning I would like to give you. My first point, show yourself a man by preparing your family for the future. My first point, showing your family a man by preparing your family for the future. Look at what it says. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon, his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore show thyself a man. Fathers, husbands, brothers, what are you doing to prepare your children and your grandchildren for the future in Christ, Sean? David was preparing Solomon for his death. He said, I go the way of the earth. That's symbolic of saying, I'm getting ready to die. David was given the promise of legacy through his children. He was determined that before he died, that Solomon was capable of passing on this promise that God gave him. He prepared him by charging. Look at the word. It says charge. He charged him, placing the responsibility of being a man upon him. Now, David was saying to his son, I've shown you what to do. Now, do it. It is our job, men, to get our children ready to be godly men, to be godly women for Christ Jesus. The way to do that is to teach your children about Jesus, Brother Paul. He says, show yourself a man at the last part of that text. To keep it simple, for his son David laid out requirements of being a man of God. He did this in sequential detail. He did it in sequential order for David. He laid it out for Solomon. He said, show yourself a man. Let's look at the verse 3. And it says in verse 3, we see the following. He kept charge. Thank you. Before I go further, these are the top five things that men, when they were polled, they asked them, what did you do to prove yourself a man? These are the top five. Thousands of men were asked this question. They said, had multiple lovers, to be athletic, to drink alcohol, never show emotion, or lie about your success. So these are the top five things that men have said or done to prove themselves to be a man. None of those things line up with God's word. Not a word, amen? So this is what God does. Look at the text, verse 3. 
and kept the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou may prosper in all that thou doest and whatsoever thou turnest thyself. My second point, God personalizes his word just for you. God personalizes his word just for you, Richard. Look at how God personalizes it. First, keep the charge means it's your job. Your responsibility to do this. It's not your wife, brothers. It's not your sisters, brothers. It's not the government's job. It's not the church's job to take care of your family. It is your responsibility. You can't pass responsibility for caring for your family on to other people. No one else can do it but you. That's the part that makes you a man. See, David was telling Solomon, walk in God's ways means your lifestyle needs to be holy and honorable. Keeping it means to obey and not disobey, doing things your own way, but submitting yourself to God's authority over your life. Basically saying, God, my life is in your hands. Lord, I trust you completely. Brothers, that's what we must do. We must humbly submit ourselves to God's authority. But look at how God makes it personal for each and every man in this house. Randy, take a look at it. He takes the word thou. That's old English, but in modern English, the word thou means you. So put your name, brothers, right there where it says the word thou, and say this part of the verse again. As it is written in the law of Moses that Randy may be in charge of his family may prosper. Paul may be in charge of his family and prosper. Richard may be in charge of his family and prosper. Sean may be in charge of his family. Thou may prosper in all that thou doest and wheresoever thou may turn. Put your name where the word thou is and that's personal for you. Because God wants a relationship not with somebody else. He wants it with you. See how personal he gets with it? He plugs in. If you plug in your own name, and here's the best part of this, there's a treasure hidden right in the text. The word prosper means extra. It means more. It means success in your life. All you have to do, brothers, is this, is to walk, to keep, to obey God's word. But here's the best part. In everything you do, and when we do it, what happens? We prosper. Somebody say prosper. Why? Because we show ourselves to be men of God, being obedient to God, so we will get blessed by God. God will bless you and show you favor when you show and honor Him with your life. The life of your family, the life of your finances, with your life by being obedient to Him. Brothers and sisters, it has always been. It's never been someone else's responsibility. It has always been the responsibility of man to be in charge of his family, Geraldine. In Genesis 2, hit the slide. In Genesis 2, God gives man his word and then he gives him a job, his work, and then he gives him a wife. Genesis 3, God called man out for accountability. He didn't call for Eve, he called for Adam. He said, Adam, where are you? In 1 Corinthians 11 and 1, Paul, yes you, Paul tells us to follow God's example. Imitate Christ. But in verse 3, he explains the divine order of things. God, Jesus, man, and that woman. But here's the thing, Joshua 24 and 15 says, he demonstrates how serious he is. A man named Joshua took his own responsibility, owned up for it, and said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Brothers, let me be clear about it. Ephesians 6 and 4 doesn't pass this baton off to the woman. It doesn't give it to somebody else to do. It says right there in clear words, fathers, do not provoke your children by anger, but the way you should treat them, but rather raise them up in the discipline and instruction. The responsibility for teaching your children is our responsibility, not your wife. Not your father, your brother, your sisters. And it says, fathers, you made that baby. You raised that baby. You teach that baby. Don't let it be a maybe. It's your baby. Deuteronomy 6 says, you around that table. I used to love this show. Father knows best. You see those family holding hands together. We don't see that much on TV programming no more. TV programming, matter of fact, has eliminated, has removed God from it. But he says there, thou may fear the Lord thy God. Keep all his statutes, his commandments, which I command you, and you and your son and your grandson, and all 
the days of your life that your days may be prolonged. Again, there's a promise from God. That's Deuteronomy 6 and 2. We are responsible. It doesn't say the wife there. Son and your grandson. That's the father, the son, and his grandchildren. And even though it could be a female grandchild or a male grandchild, it's your responsibility to instruct that child. Which leads me to my third point. Look at the text, verse 4. That the Lord may continue his word, which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, he said, a man on the throne of Israel. My third point, God gives you your posterity. Your future, that's what that means. Posterity means your future generations. If you obey him, how many of you have grandchildren here today? How many have grandchildren here? That means including women and men. How many have grandchildren? So here's the thing. The posterity means all future generations of people that come from you. In this case, David and Solomon, that means all of their children and grandchildren. Go ahead and hit the slide one more time. As you see that man keeping up, that man is doing what? He's walking as his father walks. So he's walking in the same way. So what does it have to do? As fathers, Solomon would have to do this. In order to keep this blessing, he had to pass it on to his descendants. That's that young man walking next to him. And then his children's children. This represents the legacy which lasts after you and I are gone. If you continue in obedience to God's word, the blessing of posterity passes on to your children. But here's the catch, my brothers. They have to follow in obedience as well. Meaning, if their children take heed, meaning obey, walk before God in truth, walk before God in sincerity with their heart and their soul. The word all means, here's the blessings, the legacy, the future, your children, your children's children, and your great-grandchildren. There shall not fail to be a man on the throne of Israel. There is a posterity, meaning a legacy for you. All Solomon had to do was to teach his children and their grandchildren how to be obedient to God's word. There will always be a child of yours. But in this case, there will always be a man on the throne of Israel. That's it. But let's make it even more personal, my brothers. Men, teach your family about Jesus. Pray with them. Love on them. Set the example. Follow the example David set for his son Solomon. For your own family and for your own children. You will definitely do one thing for sure if you do that. You will leave a lasting legacy. Your children. Your posterity. The Bible says as long as you are on the land, your children will be blessed if they are obedient to God. So after you're passed and gone, your children will be blessed by God, Teresa. But what what will the legacy of men be? Will it be one of revered, loving remembrance? Or one of epic failure and tragedy because you failed to obey God? Choose this day life. Say it, sweet name with me. Somebody say Jesus. Yeah. Look at that text because this is what we're ready to talk about the Lord. Verse 4 again. That the Lord may continue in his word, which he spoke concerning me. If thy children take heed to their walk, to their way, before me in truth with all their heart and with their all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. This is what I'd like to give you my fourth point. God will keep all of his promises. God will keep all of his promises for you and your family's future. Take a look closely at this. This is the simplest of all the points I'm going to give you today. This has got to be the most easiest point. If your children do what they've been taught to do, there will always be a king on the throne. That's what God was saying to David. That's what David was saying to Solomon. And all Solomon had to do was teach his children. Men, all we've got to do is teach our children to love Jesus and tell them to do it. They do it and then they tell their children to do it. Now, God had promised David way back in 2 Samuel 17, 7th chapter, that there will always be a man on the throne in Israel. All David had to do was be obedient to God 
And then he would ensure that Solomon would obey God and understand totally what is required of him. There will be future generations of David's grandchildren on the throne. All they would have to do is look at the text. If thy children heed to their way to walk. Now, Richards, do you know why we have first and second kings? It's because they didn't heed their walk. Most of David's grandchildren, Mr. Nell, stumbled, they staggered, they slipped, they tripped, and fell down. Those few that remained, Miss Nancy, those few that remained, held on, remained firm, obeyed, and stood for the Lord, we remember their names. Minerva, we remember Hezekiah, we remember Asa, Jehoshaphat, and the good young king Asa. But Erica, the rest of those kings were a mix between the not so good, the very bad, and the things they did were just plain ugly. But Miss Rebecca, David allowed God' legacy, God allowed David's legacy to remain. Took look, take a look at the text right here. There's a man not walking. If you notice that one, the fifth one on, on the left right there, he's not walking. All the other kings are walking in, in stride. Now here's the thing: he represents all those kings that were in disobedience to God's word. Their reign or rule didn't last very long, and God took them out. But God replaced that godly king that was obedient to him. And now you have a godly king that's walking for the Lord. Husbands, fathers, men, we have to be that man of God that God has called us to be. We must walk worthy of our calling. We can't be stumbling along. We can't be bumbling along. We have to walk worthy of our calling as fathers and as husbands. But my fifth and final point before we decide to go to Red Lobster for all of us fathers who are going, or if they take us to the Mr. and Mrs. on Crabs or wherever we're going to honor our fathers today. I'm trying to throw it out there, brothers. The, the, the ladies ain't biting on that, on that, on that, on that lure, on that, on that lure. Miss Anita, my fifth and final point: God will show you and tell you His word, the proof for life and the lives of your children. Here's the proof. Jesus is called the son of David for a reason. The Messiah was promised to come from the house of Judah and it was promised that he would be from the sin of David. 2 Samuel 7, 16 says, And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. The word established forever means just that, forever. You need more evidence, more proof that God keeps his word? Look at the last part of verse 4 right there in red. There shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. What that means, let me put some Bible to it. Revelation 5.5 5 says, Behold, of the elders said unto me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scrolls to loosen the seven seals. Anybody here today know what that name is? Somebody say his name with me. Somebody say Jesus. The lion of Judah, Jesus. The root of David, Jesus. Oh, it gets better. Revelation 5.7 says he sat on the throne. It gets even better, better. Hebrews 12 to look upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. For who, for the joy who was set before him, endured the cross, despised the shame, and here it is, sat down at the right hand of the Father on the throne. There's always a man on the throne for David. That last man is Jesus. Jesus is a man on the throne of Israel. He's taking a rest. He's taking a seat. He's ruling and reminding us that God has prepared his people by giving them his word. That God personalizes everything for his children. That God gives us our prosperity. He keeps it intact for us. God keeps his promises. If you don't believe me, when you get home... Read Matthew chapter 1. That's the lineage of Jesus through every person from Abraham to David and from David through every king. That's 42 generations of sons of David. Still need proof that God, that Jesus is the son of David, sitting on his throne? Well, here's the thing about the Bible, y'all. The Bible speaks the truth about family problems. You may have had some bad examples, brothers, sisters, of men who may have been fathers, or you may know of some. Maybe men, your daddy was a drunk, but so was Noah. Maybe your daddy was in jail, so was Joseph and Jeremiah and Paul. Maybe your daddy may have killed a man, so did Moses and David. 
Maybe your papa was a Rolling Stone. So was Samson. Maybe your daddy had some baby mama drama. So did Abraham and Jacob. So maybe even your mama might have been a harlot. But Solomon took a harlot named Rahab and made her into his housewife, who was a descendant of Jesus. I'm going to say it again. The Bible speaks the truth about family problems. But the thing is this. It speaks the truth about one thing. It speaks the truth about loving Jesus. Because you got to be. You must be born again. Randy, let's take a look at this picture right here. Let's pretend that picture you see right there. And Richard, you're playing. George Clooney's playing your role right now. That's you. Let's pretend that picture is a group of fathers. The football represents their families. They stand ready to protect their family, to provide and defend their families. But Margie, God has made man the quarterback for their families. And as we are quarterbacks for the families, we make the calls on the line. We make the choices that are the best way for us to lead our families against the attacks from the devil. We know how best to defend and protect them. But the thing is, we mess up a family when a father doesn't study the playbook, playbook for offense. That's the Bible, y'all. When the players don't know what the playbook is or where they need to be on the field, that messes up the whole game. The men, our Bible is our playbook. We must study the Bible. We must have soul-saving knowledge of what's inside the Bible so that we can teach our family. And hello, somebody, help me out. That we can teach our family. That we can teach our family. That we can teach our family so they can survive from day to day. Dad, remember what the football represents? That represents your family. You got to keep your eye on the ball, brothers. Because if you don't, that's a turnover. That's an error. That's a mistake. Men, fathers, we can't take our eyes off the ball. And we can't take our eyes off our families, Mike. If we do, the devil will sure to destroy our family. We got to stick it to them. We got to stick it to them. We got to stick it to them. And keep your eyes on the ball and protect them against attack. You're going to get hit hard sometimes. You're going to get hit hard sometimes. But we were built to last. We're going to get hit. And we're going to get hit. And we're going to get spun around. Look at that brother right there. Edelson in the Super Bowl went against three defenders. Remember what that ball represents. It represents our family. He kept his eye on the ball in the first picture. He put his eye on the ball and caught the ball. And in the last picture, he fought for the ball. you got to fight for your families. It may look like you're going to lose sometimes. Looks like you down and out. 28 to 3. Game is over. Everybody counts them out. But let me tell you, you got to stay in the fight. You're going to get hit on the left. You're going to get hit on the right. They're trying to take you up. That's the devil's job. But your job, my brothers, your job, my sisters, your job, my friends, we must stay in the fight. Because you can do all things through Christ to strengthen you. Tony Evans says, a kingdom man is a man that understands that God never said a godly life will be easy. Let me tell y'all right now. It ain't easy living for God. The world's going to hate on you. The world's going to criticize on you. You may have even some criticism in your own home. But here's the thing about living a godly life. He just said it would be worth it. It'd be worth it. There's a blessing for it. In all the scriptures we just read, you see the promises for a future and a hope and a life. That's from God. But if you're obedient, trusting in God, leaning and depending solely on Him, get ready for the greatest comeback ever. You're going to come back like no one ever, ever seen before. If you remember that Super Bowl, they came from behind 28 to 3 to 34 to 28. But you're leaning and depending solely on Jesus. Get ready for the greatest comeback. And then you'll be like Jesus in everything you do. You'll be victorious in raising your children. You'll be victorious in leading your families to Jesus. And then you'll be a goat. Drop it one more time for me. Then you'll be a goat. You'll be an MVP and then a champion. One more time. But the greatest comeback ever. Hello, somebody. The greatest comeback ever. Hello, somebody. The greatest comeback ever. When they said he was out, they said he was down. He rose again from the grave on the third day. On the third day, he rose. That's the greatest comeback ever. To God 